purpose of all that was to make it easy on the eyes. So I wrote this book, When the End Comes. And when I wrote it, I thought, man, there's so much more I would like to say. And I especially want to help married people. And so I wrote this book after the first one, before the end comes, talking about things that would be very, very valuable for people who are married to cultivate in their life before they experience the loss of their marriage. And this book, as a matter of fact, is um, being used by a church in Tennessee as like a book in a married class. And it deals with, uh, as I said, a lot of things that would be helpful for married people to develop prior to the time that the disaster occurs, that the marriage ends. And then after I wrote that book, I thought, well, then the natural thing, if you do when the end comes and before the end comes, then you have to do after the end comes. All three of these books are written for people who are not married, but may be in their future. People who are married, the only way that a good marriage ends is death. Bad marriages end in all kinds of ugly ways. The only way a good marriage ends is death. So these books are written with the married people in mind, and then also obviously written for those who are a widowed. And we are just trying to, uh, number one, educate, and number two, encourage. That's what the purpose uh, of generally of the Widowhood Workshop Ministry is. Number one, educate. Number two, encourage. The uh, annual retreat that we have in Laverne, Tennessee, uh, is coming up in July, July 19 through 21 this year. Uh, there's no registration fee and won't be until after I die. If my kids decide um, to charge a registration, they can do it then, but not before then. But uh, free of charge, you can't come if you're married, sorry. If you don't have the widowed card, you can't come. Uh, we want a special occasion exclusively for the widowed people, and they come from all over the country. We're looking forward to that. There are half of an eight and a half by 11 sheet over here about uh, save the date paper and feel free to take one of those. You can go to the website and find out something about the retreat, but that is a really neat time. One of the blessings of that experience is the widowed people who come, they get to be waited on hand and foot like they were royalty. And I have five grandchildren and they're the ones that take care of everybody. Uh, three of them are here today. Now, Abby, what was it I was supposed to say that you told me to say? Okay. Um, Abby, would you like to stand up, please? If you have not yet received a notepad or a pen, Abby Ruth Johnson is going to deliver one to where you are. Did anybody get missed yesterday or this morning that needs a notepad and a pen? Oh, here, here okay. Now, and over here, okay, make sure that uh, we get a chance to give that to folks. At the bottom of those, back here behind you, honey. Oh, Laura, okay. Oh, the General Jackson, okay. Over here, Abby. The uh, General Jackson is a neat little experience when you come to the Nashville area. And a part of that retreat on uh, Saturday evening, folks are uh, welcome to take a, a trip on the General Jackson. And Laura Irwin, who is here from Bowling Green, Kentucky, kind of uh, oversees that and takes the reservations for that. But that retreat is uh, helpful to connect widowed people with other widowed people. And it, it's not a dating service. It's not a marriage factory. It's, it's not a cry fest either. It's a positive experience. And it's faith building. It's network uh, building. And it is a source of uh, education and encouragement. So feel free to let other folks know about that. And you can find more information about it on the website as we move along toward that date. And we will also have things on the public Facebook page. If you're on Facebook, please uh, plug in the search bar, three words, Widowhood Workshop Ministry. And that's the public page of our ministry. Widowhood Workshop Ministry. And like and follow that, uh, we would appreciate it. I want to talk to you a little bit, and I'm going to ask you to talk with me about this about what it's like to be widowed. This is my favorite widow, and I don't mean that to insult anybody. Her name is Millie. I met her at the Grosbeck Church of Christ on the north side of Cincinnati, Ohio, a few years ago. I was preaching in a gospel meeting there, and the preacher came to me and said, Dean, I've got this 90-year-old woman who wants to take you out to lunch. So 
I thought that'd be safe if she's 90 plus. So what shocked me was I said, okay, uh, Mark, set it up. Whatever day is fine. Wherever she wants to go is fine. She takes me to a Japanese restaurant. I did not know 90 plus year old women ate in Japanese restaurants, but that's where she took me. So the waiter comes and gets our order and then the waiter leaves and I began to talk with Millie the way I love to talk with widowed people. I said, Millie, would you tell me your story? Your love and loss story. And so she proceeds to tell me about this guy that she was married to for 63 years. She tells me about uh, their life together. She tells me about uh, him as a father. She tells me about him getting cancer. She tells me about taking care of him. And she tells me about him passing away. And then she drops a conversational bomb. She says, but that wasn't my first husband. Oh, really? I said, well, tell me about, about your first husband. She said, well, he was in General Patton's army in the Battle of the Bulge. And he died there. She said, I had him buried in France. And I remember exactly what she said after that quote. A decision that to this day I regret. His name was Ray Farmer. And he died in that battle. Now, let me give you a little bit more information. Now, if you re remember your history, we're talking about the 1940s, mid-1940s. She said, I was 19 years old. And we already had one child, uh, a little over a year old. And I was pregnant with our second child. After she told me that story, I thought, how in the world did a 19-year-old kid in the mid-1940s, pregnant with another child, a little over a year old, how in the world did she survive that? I thought, wow, that is an inspirational story. You know, if, if Millie Hartman can do this, I can do this. You know, that's where I found a lot of my inspiration early on when I was such a uh, miserable excuse for a human being struggling. I thought about the withered people I knew and I started thinking about them by name and I thought, you know what? If Marlene has done this, I can do this. If, if Frank can do this and I've seen him do this, I can do this. See, what happens is when we go through a difficult time in our life and we have that difficult time as a part of our story, our story can become somebody else's inspiration to get through a very difficult time in their life. Boy, I really enjoyed meeting Millie. She died on July the 4th. Doesn't that seem appropriate in light of her story? She, she died on July 4th of 2019. Millie Hartman, my favorite widowed person. No offense to the rest of you who are widowed. Now, the risk factors about getting uh, widowed are pretty easy. Uh, you get hitched. You say, I do. If you never... Get married, you're never going to be at risk to be widowed. And you stay married. Not everybody who gets married stays married. But if you keep living and you've said I do and you've stayed faithful to that commitment, you're the one that's going to be it. And you're the one that's going to be dealing with it. Far more likely for the female than for the male. But Cheryl Wayne Lahan has been widowed over 11 years now. I've been widowed over 10 years. I guess that makes us really special. We're like an exception to an exception. We're really old. We're really old, okay, that too. But he is older than me, okay? Let me make that abundantly clear. Now, I'm going to ask you to think out loud together with me. And I'm going to ask you, in our culture, what do we commonly associate with widowhood? Go. At least a half a dozen. Surely you can do this with me. Lo loneliness is almost always the very first thing this mentioned. It what? It only happens to older people. You remind me of Denny Hickerson in Medina, Ohio. Denny Hickerson was sitting back about halfway back on the right-hand side. I asked this question. He raised his hand. I knew him since a kid uh, at youth camp in Lisbon, Ohio. I said, Denny, okay, Denny, what do you, what in our culture do we associate with widowhood? He said, old, you know, uh, but I hope you've noted that you don't have to be old to be widowed. You just have to be married and something happen. Uh, I'd love to have a bus like the Partridge. Those of you who are younger, you'll have to Google this. 
Partridge family bus. I'd like to get a bus like the Partridge family and give everybody a brush and we'll paint it with brushes, all kind of colors, and we'll go out and we'll just travel and we'll meet younger widowed people because I think you'd be amazed. We could go down to uh, southwest Georgia and I could introduce you to Buffy who called her husband every day at lunchtime. But one day when she called him, a teacher in a faith-based school, that's what she was, still is, she called him and one day she was uncomfortable with the conversation. And when that conversation ended, she decided to get in her car and drive home, but it was a 45-minute commute. On the way home, she called her dad, a law enforcement officer, and said, Dad, would you please go to the house? I'm concerned about him. You probably know where this is going. When her father went to the house, and I'm glad he got there first, he found his son-in-law dead. He had taken his life. They had a little boy. Buffy is an amazing, amazing young lady. We could uh, travel on that bus all the way over to Grosbeck, Texas, and I could introduce you to a sweet Shauna, who has two children, Audrey and Katie, wonderful, wonderful woman. And uh, she was widowed. Brian got cancer, and he died. She is an amazing early 40-something young lady. We could uh, get on that bus, and we could go to West Tennessee, and I could introduce you to Brittany, who was married for a little over 1,300 days. I know that because I read her blog. Her husband uh, was riding in Trenton, Tennessee, and was in a terrible auto accident. He went up there to help kids. That was his job. That's what he did. He compassionately ministered to kids. And in Trenton, Tennessee, Tennessee, he was in this awful accident, and he died. She got up that morning, and she was married. And before the sun set, she was widowed. If you want to stay in West Tennessee, I could take you to Cynthia, and she could tell you the story about one day when her husband went out to do some welding on some farm equipment that he had out in the building, and he cranked up the welder. He was welding on a tank that was on the back of a truck that had diesel fuel in it. It had 75% diesel fuel and about 25% fumes. It was full of diesel fuel and fumes. And welding around that was really no problem, but what he did not know was there was a pinhole leak in that tank. And when he cranked up that welder, it blew up. It blew his body out of the building. She ran and soaked a bunch of comforters and blankets and went out and drew them on her husband's body. And he was life flighted to Memphis. And he died about two days later. 29 years old, three kids, cotton crop in the field, it's late August. How in the world do you deal with something like that? We could go over to middle, upper Tennessee and go visit Emily. Emily was awakened as a 34-year-old female in the morning, sleeping with her husband, Josh. She was awakened because he was having a heart attack. She pulled him off the bed, bed, gave him CPR, called 911. They came and got him, took him to the hospital, and he died. At age 36, she's widowed at 34, and they have one young daughter, Evie. To this day, I can still hear it in my head. Right now, telling that story, I can hear it in my head. The beep, beep, beep. Josh had chosen to be an organ donor. And when there was no hope, on his bed in the hospital, he was being wheeled to the place where they were going to harvest his organs. And with great respect, lined on both sides of the hall were the workers at the hospital. And all you could hear was the beep, beep, beep. How in the world do some people deal with some of the things they experience in their life? Our greatest hope is the grace of God that can help us not only be saved, 
but can help us through the troubles and the difficulties we have in life. Give me something else that you would associate with widowhood. New what? Skill basis. Skill basis. Martha called me. 11 months. I remember, for some reason I remember this. 11 months. She calls me from Ocala, Florida. And we're in this conversation. And during the course of the conversation. Now, let me explain something to you. I have a, I have a burden in life. Um, I call it, I, I personally have diagnosed myself with overexposure to the female gender. I've had a wife for 41 years and three daughters. No man experiences that and is normal. So, sometimes, yeah, amen, okay. That, that's the amen corner over there. Okay, now, in the course of the conversation, I have a hard time understanding women sometimes. They say, guys, can you re relate to me? I, I hear sometimes what they say, and then I think, what do they mean by that? So, Martha, in the course of the conversation, that November night, she says, uh, Dean, I hate being a man. Martha, what, what do you mean by that? She said, I hate doing what he did. Well, dumb me, I, I dig deeper. Well, like what? She said, I hate taking that thing on wheels and rolling it out to the street every week because he did that and he should still be here to do that. Yeah. Sometimes you're stuck with stuff that you hadn't done before. When you were together married, you have shared responsibilities. But when there's only one, it's all on you. Can you think of something else that you might associate with widowhood? Yeah, financial jeopardy. You know, sometimes we naively think that we have a social security system in our country and that is the safety net for all of our widowed people. Well, that's not true. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, the social security system, number one, is extremely complicated, sometimes creates great difficulty for widowed people, and I am testament to that. I think it must have taken close to a half a dozen visits to the social security system to straighten out a mess after my wife had died. And if we think that that is the adequate safety net and there's no need for financial assistance, you're naive. That's not true. The U.S. Census Bureau has done some studies about this. And widowed females, now I'm not about to say what the number is when a person goes from being a senior citizen to elderly. Uh, the U.S. Census Bureau just used this word. Elderly women, whoever they are, elderly women who are widowed are three to four times more likely to live in poverty than elderly women who are married. That's the U.S. Census Bureau. We should not underestimate the financial needs of some widowed females. Can you think of anything else that you might associate with widowhood? Going to church alone. The two hardest places for a widowed person to go is number one to bed, early on especially, because it is a brutal reminder that you are A-L-O-N-E, whether you like it or not. It's an in-your-face, slap-in-the-face reminder. The second difficult place for a widowed person to go is right where you're sitting. Coming to church after you have had that practice with someone else for years can be a terribly difficult thing. The song leader picks out the wrong songs. I have decided that what a song, if a song leader wants to protect himself, what he needs to do is he needs to pick out his songs for Sunday and then email them to all the widowed people at church <laughs> to make sure that they get the seal of widowhood approval. Yeah. Amen, see? Yeah. Okay. We're going to start a new trend um, yeah, I'll tell you, coming to church can be really difficult. Some of the saltiest tears are cried in a church building because that person's not with us. You know what I really miss? Um, some of you, let me tell you this anecdote. Uh, some of you know Carla Kelly, who was here uh, last night. Uh, sweet, sweet gal. I hate that Kel 
passed away so early in their marriage. I hate the struggle that she's had. I've uh, been a friend of hers for a number of years. We've talked on the phone a number of times. Uh, as a matter of fact, I uh, ate lunch with her twice in Franklin, Tennessee. Now, I want, I want to tell you about this conversation I had with her. We had this conversation one time on the phone, and, and the word date was used in the conversation. And I said, Carla, what is a date? You, know, you remember, I have a hard time understanding women, okay? So I wanted to know, as a man, what is a date? She said, he takes me out and he pays the bill. Okay, now, this was months after that. Uh, she drove up to Franklin, and I was in Franklin to visit with my uh, wife's sister and her husband. And I said, uh, hey, could we meet and have lunch together? And so after we had a, a good lunch, and this has happened twice, I picked up the bill, and I walked to the cash register. I turned around to her, and I said, Carla, this is not a date. I'm paying the bill, but you met me here. I did not pick you up. Um, it is a, a, a challenging um, life to not be married as an adult, especially after you've lost your marriage, either by divorce or by the death of your spouse. It's, a, it's just a challenge. It's a difficult challenge that I did not realize until I had uh, experienced it. I want to share with you a long list. We don't have time to talk about all of these things. I'm just going to share with you. I'm going to blow you away with a whole bunch of stuff. Now, when I uh, show you this list, I want you to realize that a lot of what's on this list is as applicable to people who have lost their parent or maybe even grandparent or sibling or child or grandchild or suffered the loss of their health a lot of losses in life are similar. There are a lot of crossovers or overlaps. I'm going to show you this list. Now, this list has a lot of things on it that are um, worth noting especially, and I do want to note a few. Now, when you suffer great loss, you're supposed to grieve, right? Now, what if you suffer great loss and you feel relief? Can you imagine that happening? In what kind of a scenario could you have a loss and feel relief? Yes, sir. Vascular dementia for 10 years. When they die, what if a person has had cancer and suffered for a long period of time and they die? There can be a sense of relief. What if the, yes, ma'am. Before you lost them. Pre- loss, pre-death, grieving. Uh, my mother-in-law lost her uh, husband three times. She lost him when he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. He lived in the house, but he was not the person. The person that he was was gone. And so she's living with this man that she, in a sense, has lost. She cared for him for a number of years and did a great job, way beyond, I think, what most women would have done. Then it got so bad she had to put him in a nursing home. She lost him again. Now, that man's not living in her house. Then he died, and she lost him again. People can be married, but yet be widowed, in a sense, because they've lost him in some way, either to the disease or to having had to be moved out, and then also death. Yes, sir. Yes, ambiguous grief. Now, what if, uh, what if you um, are supposed to be feeling grief, but you feel relief? How's that going to make you feel? I call it internal confliction. Okay, you're not. You think you're feeling in a way and thinking in a way that you shouldn't be. Well, now what about tears? Whenever you suffer loss, what are you supposed to do? Shed tears, right? Okay, now, uh, when we shed tears in the presence of another person, what do we say? I'm sorry. What do we have to be sorry for? Absolutely nothing. As a matter of fact, you go ahead and shed those tears. You can shed crocodile tears if you'd like, because that's very helpful because it educates the other person that loss is tough. 
people who have never experienced great loss need to be educated. One way they're educated is by you who have suffered great loss. Don't apologize for crying. I re remember earlier I said, you know, I have that burden, that overexposure thing to the female gender. Um, I can cry at the drop of a hat. I love uh, up and uh, family type movies that are romantic in nature. Uh, you know, what we typically call Hallmark movies. Now, I had to beg off of them for about two or three years. There's no way I could watch that uh, whenever uh, my wife passed away. But I got over that. I got to a better place. I love, I love to watch those kinds of movies because they're about people and relationships and experiences. And they always end nice. I like that part. But the reality is, you know, we're going to have reactions and we're going to tear up because of things we see and things, let me tell you, that we hear, things that we smell even can trigger your grief. I was pushing my wife in a candy, in a bakery candy section of a big restaurant in Hartville, Ohio, and all of a sudden I started tearing up. And that's not uncommon because of this overexposure problem I have. Um, so I got, I got to wondering about my, what, what, why am I tearing up? And then it dawned on me. I saw chocolate and peanut butter fudge. Now, to a lot of people, that wouldn't be a big deal. But when I see chocolate and peanut butter fudge, there's only one thing I think about. And it's not the sugar and it's not the calories. It's my mother. Because every Christmas, one thing we could guarantee was that we would have chocolate fudge and peanut butter fudge. My mom had passed away. And seeing that fudge triggered tears. We're going to have tears, most of us. But do you know there are people who can't cry? Yeah, I mean, physiologically, they cannot cry. Now, what if you think you're supposed to be crying, but you're not crying? How's that going to make you feel? There you are. Again, you're a mess. Because you're not like you think you should be. You suffer an additional burden because of a lack of understanding about grief. People's reaction to loss is different. For different reasons. We'll talk about that later. You have a heartache that you've never experienced before and you might, might start asking questions you've never thought of. Some of those questions may be spiritually toned. We talked about yesterday why. One of the things that grief causes us to do is wonder why. That's the effect it has on us because we want an explanation. We want to figure this out. One of the problem with people like engineers present company included, because they're all alike. Engineers are all the same. Uh, I have a son-in-law who is, okay? Now, <clears throat> engineers want to figure stuff out. They're geared that way. They're trained that way. They're inclined that way. I was uh, talking to a lady in um, Georgia, North Georgia, Blue Ridge, Georgia. Her name is Cindy. Uh, she, for many years, was a physics, te physics teacher in high school. Well, what does a physics teacher, physics teacher do? They learn to figure stuff out. Well, she was really struggling. And one thing that I talked to her about is about her profession, her skill set, her inclination because of all of her work history. And one of the things I explained to her is, Cindy, you got to understand that there are times and things you can't figure out. You just can't figure it out. You've got to live without answers. And faith is how you live without answers. You may wonder about, about why, though. Why me? Why am I the one left? Why did it happen now? Why couldn't it have happened, you know, 10 years down the road later? Why did I get ripped off? Why, why couldn't I have him or her or somebody else longer in my life, we start beginning to wonder. Now, let me, let me quote to you something that I think is very helpful. This is a perspective I developed as a result of study about reality, truth, and providence. Now, here's the quote. I think this really can help you in your life. Not everything that happens in this world is God's will, but in everything that happens, God has a will. Now, sometimes when we use the 
terminology God's will. And most of the time, in our culture, when people use that phrase, they automatically equate that with that's what God wanted to happen. If you go to somebody who suffered great loss and you tell them this must have been God's will, what are they going to conclude from that? It's what God wanted. So God has intentionally hurt me. We need to be real careful about, you know, what we think and are trying to convey what we think into somebody else's brain accurately is extremely difficult. And sometimes what we mean to send as a message is not the message received. There is permissive will, God's permissive will. Like in James chapter 4, if the Lord permits, if the Lord wills and the crick don't rise, it's raining today, okay, Lord willing, there's a permissive will. Everything that happens in this world, God permitted to happen. He permitted Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. He permitted Adam to be so stupid as to do what he knew was wrong and went ahead and did it anyway. 1 Timothy chapter 2, she was deceived. He was not deceived. God permitted all that to happen. God permitted the world to continue to deteriorate and then to have to have a great flood and wipe the earth clean. God permits things. That doesn't mean he wanted them to happen. God does not want domestic violence in our families. God does not want the drunk to go left of center and maim or take the life of innocent people in the other car. Not everything that happens in this world is God's will in the sense of what he wanted to happen. He did permit it, but that doesn't mean he wanted it to happen. Not everything that happens in this world is God's will, but in everything that happens, God has a will. Do you know what that is? It's for him to be glorified and for us to be a blessing to others. That's the constant. Whenever you get the dream job, you get to be married to the right person for you. Whenever you have a, a baby and you're able to grow a family and whenever you're enjoying prosperity, do you know what the Lord's desire is? That he be glorified and you be a blessing because of how you've been blessed. When we're suffering adversity, the same desire of God is that he be glorified and we be a blessing to others. I have news for the world. God is concerned about our holiness. In our culture, we've made happiness a God. And we use what we believe is God's desire for us to be happy, when actually God's desire is for us to be holy. If we're holy, we're going to find contentment and happiness. But sometimes people will say, God wants me to be happy, so I'm going to do this. And justify something that is totally against his will. God wants him to be glorified and us to be a blessing to others. But we're going to struggle sometimes with our faith. That father that brought his son to Jesus in Mark chapter 9, he said, Lord, I believe. He saw his child toss and turn, foam at the mouth, and he came to the Lord, knowing the Lord could help him. Lord, I believe. Then what did he say right after that? Help my, my what? Unbelief. Don't be surprised if in the midst of the storm of loss, you or somebody else begins to question God. Question themselves and their faith. It can be a spiritual struggle like we've never had before. So in addition to the faith struggle, the loneliness that we've talked about, and the identity crisis, I have good news for you. You are not your age. You are not your health condition. You are not the amount of money that you have in the bank. All those things are just a part of your story. You're a creature who exists because of God. You exist in his image and after his likeness. If you're a Christian, you're redeemed by the blood of Jesus and you're a Christian. That's your identity. Our identity is our relationship with God. It has nothing to do with our circumstances. Not one thing to do with our earthly, temporary circumstances. But because we've been married, we have a tendency to permit that marriage to become our identity. And it can shake us. Who am I? I used to be his wife. I used to be 
her husband. Who am I now? Well, you're the same person that you were before you ever got married. A creature that exists in the image of God and after his likeness. What a blessing that is. That is your identity. The loneliness can be a real struggle. Remember the gal who now does a lot of cute commercials. If, if you have her contact information, please give it to me because I want to interview her. Kathy Lee Gifford. She's about my age. That's not the reason I want to uh, interview her. I want to interview her because of her life. She was uh, married before. Her uh, second husband also was married before, Frank Gifford. I am so old, I remember watching him on a black and white TV as a running back for the New York Giants. Uh, I, he was great. Well, they got married. They were married for 29 years. Frank died. He was significantly older than she was. And after Frank died, you know, um, she was on the Today Show for a number of years. After uh, Frank died, you know, she struggled greatly. And she's been interviewed. And I've watched some of the uh, interviews on YouTube TV. I've also read some articles I read one article about her in the AARP magazine. Now, I know you're probably wondering why in the world would Dean be reading AARP magazine. And I appreciate that. But um, here's a couple of things that she said. In, uh, in those interviews, one thing she said was she was experiencing crippling loneliness. She didn't say she was lonely. She said she was experiencing crippling loneliness. And in another interview... She was asked why she moved from New York City down to Franklin, Tennessee, outside of Nashville. I mean, New York City, you know, the hub of all the activity, the city that never sleeps. Why did you move down to Middle Tennessee? She said, because I was dying. That's the word she used. I was dying of loneliness. Who knew that it was that challenging? A unique kind of loneliness I wish I would have recognized that after my father died the financial jeopardy we've talked about and what you're having to deal with is forced change and what you have to deal with too is the absence of that person when you look at the favorite seat where they sat what do you see it's empty it's air and having to deal with what you see sometimes I have a very good friend who's the preacher at the Main Street Church in uh, Pikeville, Kentucky, about a year and a half ago, he lost his seven-year-old son, Andrew. They think it was RSV, but they don't know for sure. You wonder about his bedroom? You know, that's a very difficult issue to deal with. Um, what are you going to do about that bedroom? You know, for some people, they might want to make it a memorial. And that would be a good way for them. Other people want to totally change it. And that's okay if that's what they need to do. It's their choice. But you have to deal with the absence of that person. Now, you're going to have dreams because you are not in control of your brain. Are, are you like me? I have a hard enough time controlling my brain when I'm awake. When you go to sleep, your brain's going to go wherever it wants to go. Now, did you know, and you probably didn't, unless you've lost somebody really close to you, do you know it's not uncommon for a widow or a widower to have dreams about their spouse years after that spouse has died? I'm talking about over a decade. I'm talking about like 15 years. That's not an uncommon thing. You're not going crazy when that happens. Your mind's going to go wherever it went. If you were really attached to that person and cultivated a real special intimacy, I mean, what do you expect? You may have dreams, even if you were to remarry, and you know there are people who, many people who do remarry, and we're going to talk about that Sunday night, by the way, but can you imagine being married to somebody else and having dreams about your first mate? That, that is not an uncommon thing. Now, we have to realize that that's just a part of the experience. People make noise. How many times have you wives hollered to your husband who was somewhere else, what in the world are you doing? Or the guy has said, honey, banging around those pots, do you need some help? People make noise. Well, in a widowed person's house, 
who lives alone, there is no noise. You have to begin to deal with the noise. When my mother-in-law passed away, I explained at her memorial service to her family. I said, none of us, I called her mama bear. That was a term of endearment. Um, I said, none of us know about the deafening silence in mama bear's house. She lived as a widowed female for over a decade. By the way, the average length of time a woman is widowed in our country is 14 years. Now, uh, the silence, you have to deal with that. The emptiness in your life, you have to deal with that because that person helped to fill up your life. And now you have a dependence that you don't like to recognize. And don't be as stubborn as Marlene was. After I left Hartville, Ohio, and occasionally when I go back there, I always visit with widows and widowers when I'm back there. And uh, I visited with Marlene. And I was sitting with Marlene. We had a good visit. Her husband's name was Addo. He wore crazy socks. That's what he was known for. And so we were talking, had a great visit. I was getting ready to leave. I found out that she had a, a light that wouldn't come on when she flipped the switch. And I said, Marlene, hey, before I leave, I want to check this light uh, that's not working. She said, oh, don't, don't mess with it. I'm fine, Dean. Don't worry about it. I said, Marlene, no, I really want to do this before I leave. And she said, no, don't bother with it. I said, Marlene, if you don't let me look at this light, I am going to move in with you. She said, here's the stool. <laughs> well, I got up there. Do you know what she needed? A light bulb. She just needed a light bulb replaced. We need to be willing to accept the fact that there are times we need to be help, helped in our life. Even married people, you know, we need to accept the fact, you know, none of us knows everything about anything, and sometimes we need help. There's no shame in asking for somebody's help or accepting somebody's help, and there's certainly no shame in even maybe paying uh, somebody to do something for you as an expression of appreciation, not as a payment for services rendered. The stress level is incredible, and it's not uncommon to have anger and why in the world would you be angry? Who would you be angry at? God. So we're going we're gonna to be angry at God. Well, um, that's not uncommon. Because God let it happen. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to talk about some things God let happen in my life. One time he let something happen that made me mad. And I'll confess to you tomorrow. I'm not going to walk down the aisle at the invitation, but I am going to confess to you about a time when I was mad at God. The, the reality is that uh, you can be angry with God and struggle with your faith. And it's okay to struggle with your faith. That's not something to be ashamed of. As a matter of fact, that's kind of like a person having an orthopedic surgery and going to a physical therapist and experiencing pain to get to a better place physically. Sometimes physical therapy can be painful. Sometimes a faith struggle can be painful and difficult, but it can help you to get to a better place because you're being forced to work your faith. Okay, rebuild your faith. Who else might you be angry with? The, that's crazy. Isn't that crazy? This person up and died, they had the gall to die on you. And so you're mad at them. Okay? It may be like, like, maybe like this lady, Cheryl Wayne and I met. She's from, I just, it just dawned on me. We're in the state of Alabama. She's from Alabama. This explains a lot, come to think of it. Only in Alabama. Okay. <laughs> okay. We met this lady in Florida who uh, moved here from Alabama. She's got the accent to prove it. And uh, she told us that after her husband died, when she took a shower, she would beat the wall of the shower and she would holler at her husband. Why did you leave me? Why did you leave me? Now, some people might think she's crazy. Well, there's sometimes I think she is crazy. Don't tell her that. Uh, those of you who know her sitting back there in the back. Yeah, I've gone to meddling. Okay. Now, nah, she, would, she would get a kick out of that. Um, she was mad at her husband. That is not an uncommon thing. It really Now, some people think that that's crazy. To some people, it is crazy, but it's, it's just grieving. It was her way of grieving. She was angry at her spouse. Now, who else? There's other people you could be angry at. 
Have you ever been angry at the medical profession? Have they ever made a mistake? Are they included in the people that are nobody knows everything about anything? They make a mistake. They're human beings. In ignorance, sometimes they make mistakes. In their inexperience, they make mistakes. It can happen. It's not uncommon to be angry at the medical profession. Yes, sir. That's why they call it the practice. I call the medical profession educated, experienced guesswork. They are highly educated. They are very experienced. They are a rich blessing, but there's a guesswork element because they do not know everything. And what they do to help one human body may not help another human body. As a matter of fact, it may be a big mistake to treat one body in the same way they've treated another body with the intention of helping them. So we can be mad at the medical profession. Again, that's not an uncommon thing. Anger is a natural human emotion. It's okay to admit the fact, yes, I am mad, and grapple with that anger and begin to process that anger. Why are you angry? How can you address that? And how can you learn from this experience of being angry? There can be a blessing in experiencing anger. There's a worry and a fear that you have because now you are A-L-O-N-E in a broken world. You're a mess because you're not the person you used to be because you've experienced a great crisis in your life. And not only that, but you're going to have a restlessness you're going to do a lot of tossing and turning because your life has been turned upside down. Who knew that people who've suffered great loss go through such great challenges? In Chester, West Virginia, was the first place I ever did a workshop like this. And after this session, a man in, I would guess, his early 80s, bald-headed, glasses, he came to me and he said, Dean, I've got something I'd like to ask you add to that list and this is what he told me now tomorrow if you're here and there's hopefully going to be a bunch of people here maybe 300 maybe even in excess of that if you think that there isn't somebody maybe even some bodies in this room who hasn't had suicidal thoughts that week, you'd be naive. There are a lot more suicidal thoughts than there are suicides. There are way too many suicides. We can experience something so significant that we can think about things that we'd never thought about before, even things like taking our own lives. It's a mess. It's a difficult challenge. Why is this so difficult? What is it about this experience that is so difficult? This is an explanation for it right here. It is a unique human relationship. On planet Earth, there are over 8 billion people. How many people are in a marriage? Of 8 billion people. Boy, if that doesn't communicate how special the marriage relationship is, what in the world does? It is such a unique Special relationship that ought to be treasured. I keep saying this over and over and over again. If you are married, treasure what you have before you lose it. Because one of the two of you will, if you have a good marriage, treasure every moment that you have. It is such a special relationship. That relationship ought to be like this. Here's the recipe for a magnificent marriage. There is no recipe for a perfect marriage because they're only imperfect people in that relationship. You take two people who are all about the total giving of the total self for a total lifetime, no matter what their socioeconomic differences are, if they have skin color differences, if they have a difference of age, if they are buying into the total giving of the total self for a total lifetime, they can make it happen. Let me tell you about this lady in Albuquerque, New Mexico that I know. This lady in her early 30s got married. She married this guy in his early 60s. 30 years, 30 years difference. They had a great marriage. He died in his early 90s. For 30 years, they lived together and had a great marriage. What matters is how much we're willing to invest in that relationship. And when you have people who invest this heavily, 
and then lose that blessing, it's going to shake you to the core of your being. I didn't know that until it happened to me. Don't ever say to a widowed person, unless you want to be punched in the face, I know how you feel. That ain't true. Can't be true. As a matter of fact, don't ever say that to anybody. Because you don't. We don't live in somebody else's skin. We live in our skin. We haven't had the experiences that other person has had. We don't have the personality that other person has had. We do not know how somebody else is feeling. Now, we can relate to some people better than we can relate to other people because of what we've experienced. But don't ever go to the extreme of saying, I know how you feel because you weren't in that marriage. Families are unique, too, just like individuals and couples are unique. Some people are very quiet, uh, not very open, not very transparent. Some people are very transparent and talk about everything. You've got some families that are very functional and some that are not functional at all. Some people are married for a long time. Some people are married for a short time. I, I didn't bring that list with me this morning. But, um, you know, there are people, I, I know people who have been married 10 years, 5 years, 2 years, 5 months. Some marriages are very short. Because what puts you in the prospect of widowed category is saying, I do. That never dawned on me. Until after my wife died, that never dawned on me. That's why it's so important for people who are married to understand about widowhood. If we believe in premarital counseling to help a person go from being single to being married, how about helping married people, educating them about the transition from being married to being widowed? If premarital counseling makes sense, and I hope it does, then I think there ought to be some education about the experience of widowhood. At some point in time, and we've got people who are going to distribute, arise, get vertical, please. Okay, if you are widowed, I want to make sure you raise your hand and we have got uh, a gift to give to you. Raise your hand. If you are widowed, whoa, look at all those hands that went up. Okay, girls hit the road. Uh, Cheryl Wayne, you might need some help. Okay. <laughs> okay, I won't then. Okay, when you've lost your mate, you are on a grief journey. Initially in that grief journey, you are going to grieve deeply. Because what has happened to you is a door has been slammed shut and locked. You don't like it. You hate it. And you stare at that slam shut locked door and you just cannot believe that you're dealing with what you're dealing with. Now that is harsh. You're on a grief journey and at some point in time after you grieve deeply you've got to awaken to the fact that you've come to a fork in the road. Now what that means is may I have one? What that means is You've got to start doing what you did when you picked up your fork. Now, by the way, I'm giving you this fork not to use it to eat. Well, unless you want to lose weight, you can use it to eat, okay? I'm giving you this fork for this reason. I want you to lay this fork somewhere in your house where you see it every day. Some people lay it on their kitchen counter. Some people lay it on the place wherever they sit and watch TV. Some people will lay it on their nightstand, but lay it somewhere where you'll see it every day. Now, when you pick up your fork, what have you decided to do? Eat. Now, what else are you deciding about as you hold that fork in your hand? Give me some other things you're deciding about. What you're going to eat. Did, did your mama tell you the story about the starving kids in China? Okay, you know... Eat, eat. There are kids in China who are dying because they don't have the food. Okay, you have decided to eat. You're also deciding what you eat. I guess all of us have gotten to the point where we could leave something on the plate and we wouldn't have a parent to chew us out because of that. You know, we decide what we're going to eat. We decide how much 
of something we're going to eat. We decide about when we're going to quit eating, right? While the fork is at hand, a lot of decisions are being made. In your grief journey, what you've got to decide is, what am I going to do with my life now? See, you've got to do deep grieving first. That needs to be the sole focus early on. But at some point in time, you've got to realize you've come to a fork in the road. You've got to decide, what am I going to do the rest of my life? Don't die until you're dead. Some people die when their mate dies or their child dies. But you're still alive. Don't just merely exist. Choose to live. Now, early on, it's hard to do that. But we need to learn I have not died. I can and I will live this life with this loss the rest of my life. I can do that. And I don't want to waste my pain. I want to glorify God and I want to use what I've experienced in my life to be a blessing to other people. That is where we need to go after we've gone and suffered great loss in our life. Remember, when you're gifted something you don't want, what you have to do is you have to learn to live with it. You can't hide it. You can't forget about it. You don't want to re-gift it to anybody else. You don't want to give it back to the giver. You have to learn to embrace it and accept it. I am a widower, but a widower is not what I am. It's a part of my story, but it's not who I am. I'm a creature of God, I exist in his image, and I exist for the purpose of glorifying him. I'm a child of God, I am a Christian, that is my identity. The fact that I suffered great loss is a part of my story, and that part of my story I am going to use just like my conversion to Jesus as a way of glorifying God and helping other people. Some widowed people are almost ashamed to use that word to identify themselves. Some of you, when you were younger, maybe you were forced to read the Scarlet Letter. I've decided if I ever write again another book, it's going to be titled The Black Letter. You know what the black letter is? W. Let me read to you the introduction of a book written by a widow lady. Imagine a single event that will dramatically change your calendar, your checkbook, your friendship network, the contents of your refrigerator, the temperature you set your thermostat, your outlook on your future, and your connection with your children. And that's not all. Your appearance may change, your emotions, your sleep patterns, your theology, your social status, and possibly your, your address. I experienced most of these changes and more beginning April 21, 2006, the day I became a widow. I don't like that word, and I still will not check that box to identify myself. Whew, I'd want to keep my distance from that woman. I can relate to that. I, I can understand where she's coming from. But here's a different perspective. Let me tell you about Miss Betty. Miss Betty was married to a man. They were married when they were very young. He went off into the military, came back from the military. They were married, and he was a teacher, and he got a bad illness. He became, to a great extent, disabled. She had to push him around in a wheelchair, and she did that for years. He became a, uh, not only a teacher, but he became a preacher. And he went around a lot of different places in southeastern Ohio and in West Virginia preaching. And she was the one that made all that happen. There were times that he was in the hospital. And when he was in the hospital for extended times, she lived at the hospital with him. But she was a full-time English teacher in high school in Weirton, West Virginia. So when he was in the hospital, she would be with him all evening after school. She'd sleep there at the hospital. She'd shower at the hospital. Then she'd go teach. And then she'd come back to the hospital and she was with her husband. She was an amazing lady. What an inspiration. It was going to be until death do us part. Well, he ended up dying. The first year anniversary of his death, she posted about 
that date and that first anniversary about the loss of her husband, Jim. A friend of hers made a comment on the Facebook page, and he said, Betty, hoed her row all the way to the end. I thought, what a neat thing to say. What a positive statement to make. Not everybody hoes their row all the way to the end. But Miss Betty did. I did. Cheryl Wayne did. Those of you who are widowed, you did. You did something a lot of people in our world, even Christians, don't do. You did. Wear that W with pride. It's nothing to be ashamed of. You hoed your row all the way to the end. I want to thank Davey for bringing this in. I told him, I said, I want a hoe, and I don't want a new one. I went into Lowe's the other day looking for a hoe, but it was brand spanking new. Do you know what it costs to get a hoe at Lowe's? 40 bucks, $39.99 if you want to be exact, and it looked way too pristine. And I said to Davey, I said, I, want a, I don't want a new one. I want an old beat up one because you know what? Being married can be a challenge. You know, the years have a way of wearing on you and all the things you experience. But those of us who are widowed, we can proudly say we hoed our row all the way to the end. Some of the people in this room had it happen real quick. Others, that last many feet were very tiring and exhausting because of what was experienced. But the end was the same. You hoed your row all the way to the end. I challenge every married person, no matter how long they've been married, you do what Miss Betty did. You hoe your row all the way to the end and don't be ashamed of the fact that you're a W. That's a mark of distinction, something that you can be proud of. Now, I will say this. I hate widowhood. I mean that literally. I hate it with a passion. In the same way a cancer patient hates their cancer. In the same way that a disabled person who maybe because of an accident has lost a limb and maybe can no longer function like they used to. There are things that you experience in life that you hate. That doesn't mean you hate your life. That's not your life. It's just a part of your story. It's a great blessing to be married. Cherish it if you still have it. Keep hoeing that row all the way to the end. I hope when you join our club, it's a club you don't want to be a part of, but I hope when you join that club, you're old and you've been married for a long, long time. But that may not be. It may be way too soon, way earlier than you'd planned. But either way, be proud of the fact that you hold your row all the way to the end. Could we pray? Let's do that. Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of life. We thank you, Father, for your love. We thank you for your presence in our life. We thank you for your book and for all that it tells us about you, about your love, and about the grace that can not only save us, but can also help us to survive the most serious storms of our life. Father, thank you for who you are and all that you do. Father, be with those who are really struggling with their lives right now because of some sort of loss especially bless those who are struggling because they've lost their spouse. Father, we pray that they will receive through the people and experiences they have in their life the things that will help them each day of their life. Some days are much more difficult than others. And help us, Father, to realize that. And help us to just keep on keeping on as best we can. Father, sometimes we expect more of ourselves than is realistic. Help us to keep in mind that we're mere mortal human beings. We're not robots. And sometimes we're not going to be what we want to be. And sometimes we're going to be frustrated. And sometimes we're going to fail to be what you want us to be. Thank you for your forgiveness and long-suffering. 
And it's in that we find peace. Father, thank you for everybody who came out. Tomorrow morning, or yes, yesterday, tomorrow as well, and then today. Father, we just pray that we're learning some things that maybe will help us and help us help others. Be with us and keep us safe through the day. We pray that we could come back tomorrow, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.